Hello and welcome to episode six of Thank You for Sporing, the show that can't shoot anything from half a mile away, but fortunately does not have to. This is Eric Skull, podcasting as always with my great friend, Chad Hopkins. Hi, Chad. Hi, Eric. Nice shirt. uh, Oh my goodness, that is so kind of you. (laughs) Nice shirt yourself, sir. Thank Uh, you. Gee, where'd you get it? (laughs) Well, I got it from you. (laughs) And I got it. From T Fury. Yes, yes. We are uh for, for audio listeners, because this is a podcast after all, this is we are both wearing a the adventures of Joel and Ellie shirt in the style of the sort of old timey comic. I don't know. What what art style would you say? Is this like Adventures of Tin Tin kind of thing? It's very t- you know, I'm glad that you asked because I couldn't pin it either until you said Tin Tin, and I'm thinking it's very much like that. There's a like a silhouetted background. They're they're caught in an action pose, running side by side profile, um, and it is of course Pedro Pascal and Bella Ramsey's likenesses as Joel and Ellie. So it's very hip. Very current. And uh, yeah, T Fury advertised this after one of the Last of Us episodes a few weeks ago. And I knew immediately that we needed them for the podcast, (laughs) not just because we do video on YouTube, uh, but it's just fun to wear this shirt and talk about the show that we love. We're slowly becoming more and more obsessed. Yeah, as soon as I saw it in my mailbox uh, when I got home from my trip last week, I was like, okay, I know what I'm wearing next time we need to talk about the show. Yeah, and mine arrived the week before, so I was waiting for, I was like, I can't wear it (laughs) until Chad's gets in. (laughs) But, uh, But anyway, this episode that aired tonight was called Kin. And I gotta love it, not only for the title, but in my HBO app, when I was clicking on the episode first, it just said episode six. It didn't list the title. But then after, and this is my first time noticing this, uh, pardon me if it's always been this way, but after the episode ended, when you go back to the page, it then said kin. So it's they're actually like adopting a no spoiler on even just the title of each episode as you watch it. Yeah, I had the same experience, uh, but I also just click play from the Last of Us adverti- advertisement splash screen on the oh, main HBO Max page. And so I don't go to the full Last of Us and then the whole episode layout. It was just click play and automatically episode six starts playing. But it finished and it went back to the episode select from there and it still said episode six. And so then I went back to the main screen, clicked on more info for The Last of Us, and then it was updated at that point. Ah, yeah, I'm watching yeah. on uh, PS5 HBO Max app, and uh, yeah, it may just be that I clicked it like right at eight, and and nobody had thought to say, wait, what's the episode <laughs> title? Um, <laughs> but if they are doing the thing where they're not posting it first, that's kind of cool. Um, although it did get us into trouble, be- or got me into trouble, because when I mispronounced the Hank Williams lyric uh, a few weeks ago, um, and I ended up going back and finding the IMDb had had typoed it wrong. Um, uh-huh. But yeah, like the fact that the episode titles haven't been released or weren't released earlier is leading to minor clerical errors, but not a big deal. This is the least interesting thing about this episode that we could possibly be talking about. (laughs) I take full credit for it. Um, But the title is apt, which which we will go on about. But speaking of adopting a spoiler policy, listeners of this show will know that uh starting in episode two uh we were very um let's say careful about not spoiling events from the video game uh the last of us and the last of us part two its sequel um before they occur uh, or before their counterpart whatever like their adjacent adaptation scene occurs on the show we're sticking to that 
but I do want to kind of do like an extra warning here um, because tonight's episode, very surprisingly and shockingly, um, did some interesting things that weren't a new spoiler policy. I, Chad, what do you think on this? How, how would you describe it? Yeah, I would just say that uh, obviously season one of the show appears to be adapting the first video game, the original video game from 2013. And we have since had another video game come out just a few years ago. And that's the game that sort of kickstarted you and I talking about The Last of Us together. But uh, there's some pretty heavy hinting in this episode specifically towards part two of the game. And so we wanted to just give that extra little bit of warning that we are not looking to overly spoil part two but we did want to give that extra sensitive uh heads up to people who are sensitive to spoilers that we will be discussing a few of the connections between this episode and what we do eventually get in part two so just wanted to put that out there and uh that will be occurring after our usual spoiler wall so yes Uh, Once again, in the show notes, there will be a timestamp I've been putting where the spoilers occur. And then and only then will we actively be talking about part two, like Chad is saying. So uh, and no worries there, because um, I'm a close editor and there won't be any mistakes. (laughs) So (laughs) I I edit the show. uh, I've been doing audio and then I do mark down like the biggest editable moments and I edit the video for YouTube. So um, there's no chance of it sneaking past me. Uh, So take comfort, y'all. Okay, (laughs) so at the start of the show, we usually talk about what we learned over the past week uh, following the action jam-packed episode five. Uh, Chad, what do you got for this? I don't have a whole lot of extra follow-up to the last episode except for two two small things first thing holy cow this was a long wait (laughs) it It was more than our usual week (laughs) um so that that it just felt like we hadn't talked about it in a long time and so i'm glad to be sitting here doing it now well Um, no this is a tonic to that but yeah i was texting you going what are we going to do between seasons like how are we possibly (laughs) because they aired the last episode two days early uh to avoid the super bowl during which kansas city won yeah by the way and i mean Uh, honestly that was really convenient for us and our scheduling because it worked out so well we both had plans for the super bowl and so it was going to be a lot to do in one night But, but, but we would have done it. And at the same time, consequentially, we now had to wait nine or is it, it was like 10 days for the, for this episode. So it felt like an eternity. I know other people were feeling the weight uh, that same way too. My update from the last week actually speaks directly to that. I learned over the last week that Jeffrey Pierce is awesome on Twitter and is being really, 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 really awesome uh, on Twitter to fans of particularly last week's episode. He has posted so many behind the scenes photographs uh, of him as Perry with the rest of the crew, uh, all sorts of interesting behind the scenes things about the cul-de-sac that was built. We also heard about that on last week's The Official Last of Us podcast. They constructed that entirely for the show because they needed to be able to control uh, production wise every aspect, Um, not just the open pyrotechnics, but lighting, choreography, everything. They just needed to control that space 100 percent. Very exciting stuff. But Jeffrey Pierce, who, by the way, is at Pierce underscore Jeffrey, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y. Give him a follow because I've just learned that he like he's the one tweeting out. It feels like an eternity talking about the time between episodes. (laughs) And tonight he posted an animated uh, gif of Shimmer, the horse, running in a field. And it wasn't a scene from um, The Last of Us. It was just a a, a horse lookalike, you know, galloping in a field. And it said Shimmer. So it turns out he's hilarious and very, very entertaining. Yeah, I don't spend a ton of time on Twitter these days, but I've seen plenty of the things that you've sent me. And uh, yeah, he does seem like a fun follow. Um, I do have one other small thing to mention, and it is also from the official podcast last week, uh, because it's a follow up to the startled comment that Craig Mazin made a couple of episodes ago. Um, 
in this most recent episode of the official podcast, uh, he said, we're not aiming to be different. We're aiming to do the best for this medium and for where we are in the story. And I said, Mason, it might have actually been Druckmann who said that, but that quote was said. And I really like that. I really like that. They are just aiming to tell a good story that makes sense for a TV show format. And if it differs from the game, cool, not a big deal. We're adapting. We are changing. We are not cloning but if it ends up being exactly the same as the game hey that's cool too and we had a couple of examples of both of those things in today's episode this just goes to show that they're doing it right and that they can t- there there's just a method they we're so blessed that they even share what the method is but the method seems to be tried and tested um and it continues to just blow my socks off um, I literally watched tonight's episode at the end of it. I didn't have socks on. Um, <laughs> I actually took them off before the episode, but that's beside like, you know, selective yeah. truth. Um, so <laughs> I'm just continually very surprised by every choice that is like, I look at it and I go, that was amazing every single time because I can't think of the last adaptation I've loved half as much. Like, right. y- you know? It's, there it's was so much be... trepidation going into this because video game adaptations have a, a history or a penchant for like not being well adapted. And there's always the exception, but we didn't know if The Last of Us is going to be one of those exceptions. And it appears to not only be one of the exceptions, but also like far beyond any expectations we really could have had for it. So with that said, shall we move into overall thoughts of episode six? Uh Sure. Which I suppose I already just gave, <laughs> but um, right, yeah, just socks socks off. That's that's the overall thought there. Yeah, I I haven't like written down my particular thoughts for this episode like I do sometimes, but again, I just continue to be really impressed with the the story choices they make. the The acting is superb on every level. We see some amazing things from Pedro Pascal in this episode. And I just can't wait to see how they wrap this season up. We've still got a few episodes left. And uh, there were parts of this episode where I theoretically knew what was about to happen. And I may or may not have been right because of my experience with the game, but I was still on the edge of my seat, my palms sweating because I didn't know what in particular they were going to do for the TV show. And I mean, that that's what I want. That That is so good. That's kind of startling. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> but uh, but but yeah, I mean, the thing that this episode did so well in the adaptation specifically, uh, listeners for this show will know that I am simultaneously playing along with the game. Um, you know, yeah, The Last of Us Part 1 remaster for PS5. I'll keep saying that every week. But I'm streaming that on... Uh, Twitch, but also it goes on the same YouTube channel that this show goes on, Eric J. Skull. And um, this part in the game, I not only went through all of Wyoming, but also made it to the University of Eastern Colorado and was leaving the University of Eastern Colorado all in a 90 minute stream. It's nothing. I don't, you know, I don't rush. I go around, I collect everything you can possibly like. I mean, I miss every, a ton of stuff, but that's right, a whole right. separate. But I, I like, take my time and i was blown away at the end of that twitch stream to look at the runtime and it was 90 minutes and i've mm-hmm. been through all of wyoming and colorado so it's not that it's not that that it feels rushed in the game it doesn't but the character development that they did in this episode with every single one of these like characters and how they interact with each other is way more meaty and that's exactly the right call they're they're people which is, mm-hmm. uh, I think, what they indicate in the behind the episode that aired at the end is Craig, I think, has a line where it's just like the, Joel is a real human person uh, here. And so you can do so much more with that. Right. I mean, we, we've we talked about how video games, you have to play it or you have to do the story from the perspective of the character that you're controlling. And uh having this tv show lets us one explore other characters perspectives and also spend more time in a moment because we're not having to worry about how exciting or not exciting this would be from a gameplay perspective and so we are getting to linger in moments and getting a lot more personal than i mean the last of us obviously has a great story but we're getting to delve even deeper here 
Absolutely. And just as a quick aside, I, mm-hmm. I think I'm going to start playing the game soon ish because I, I one, I miss it, but I, I think I'm going to do differently than you in that I will play after <laughs> the episodes. So I will catch up each time rather than I, get I love ahead. this idea. I'm gonna like at the end of my streams, I'll just be like, okay, on to you, Chad. And then you do the same <laughs> things only better. Are you gonna play it on uh, normal difficulty just like I did? Uh, no, I'll probably go for the harder difficulty area. That's oh, my thing. I, I, okay, <laughs> if you're sure, you know, it's it's yeah. tougher. You get less ammo and you don't have your flamethrower anymore. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I literally, in, in this video of uh, the University of Eastern Colorado section, I've, I've, it, I've never had it so easy before. There were four <laughs> clickers and a bloater, and I just molotov them and they went away. It was gone. Like all of them were just done and it was the whole segment where you're in the basement it's this whole thing anyway i felt really guilty when that happened (laughs) playing on it and i thought of you but you had gone to bed um but yes it it was very um i do appreciate the times when you've been sitting in on and watching that um and saying hi uh so moving on to god just this amazing episode we'll go through um kind of a scene by scene the this episode was largely spent focusing although not solely on the connection between joel and ellie and it's actually starting with a pretty big time jump it's Mm. been three months and i love the way that they set that up because they i correct me if i'm wrong because i haven't played it recently but I believe they took that time jump directly from the game. Maybe not the specific period of time, but the way they did it, where uh, they actually opened this episode. We have the previously on that we get every episode, but there was one specific moment that they left out of the previously on, and instead they put that right after the opening credits, which was Henry committing suicide. Um, And then it automatically says three months later, and it's just like this huge like jump cut of uh like wow that was a heavy thing to leave off on and now we're going to see the repercussions of that three months on absolutely yeah um the the video game it's safe to say is not segmented the way these episodes have been but it is split into quarters and specifically seasons summer fall winter spring um so that was really cool to see the the three month time jump but in the show God, I thought that was a bold decision because I'm like, how has Joel and Ellie's relationship grown? They were already getting real close together in the last episode. And I know on the official Last of Us podcast, uh, Craig and Neil were both talking about Joel's hesitation and his trepidation to take care for Ellie after seeing how disastrous it went with Sam and, and Henry. I thought he was about to pull the plug on them within days. Turns out three months later, they're still together. And you know what? He's opened up quite a bit even further. He has. And uh, I love that scene that we get at the campfire. Um, One, because, I mean, the lighting's fantastic, the way the flames flicker across their faces, the stars in the sky, how bright everything is. We even get the northern lights. Um, But they talk about Ellie asks the question, what are you going to do after this? Like, what is your plan for when we get to the other side of this? And he says, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll I'll get a sheep farm and it'll be really peaceful and everybody's going to do what I ask them to do. And there's not going to be any talking back and it'll be quiet and peaceful. And uh, she expresses her interest in space and her idolization of Sally Ride as a super awesome astronaut and having an awesome name. And it's just a really cool moment where they're sort of sort of sharing their interest with each other beyond just like casual talk as they ride down the road or walk down the road. Yeah, and this Ellie and Joel campfire is really almost at this point um, like taken on a mythical quality because uh, Druckmann actually brought this up in the, in last week's episode. Uh, he said of the official podcast, he said that there there was a scene that never made it into the game and it was like a moment of levity between the two of them which eventually got replaced. But I was actually looking through my uh, Last of Us Part 1 video game extras prior to selecting New Game Plus. And one of the concept arts you do unlock is the still of uh, the original video game, Joel and Ellie laughing in the moment of levity by a campfire. And so they're they're adapting 
essentially what never was, but which still has a fragment that does exist in the game or in the games that have been released since. And I thought that was really cool. Yeah, that is really cool. Yeah. So um, with the scene of two survivors uh, and the man comes home and the woman has made Joel soup. Um, <laughs> what what did you make? What did you make of this? I, obviously, it's a very it, it's always very interesting when we're meeting other survivors because a lot of them have to be every bit as um, inhuman uh, as as one would have to be to survive. But these people maintain a, a real sense of, I guess, at least most normalcy here. Yeah, they almost seem kindred spirits in a way to Bill because they say that they departed from society before all of this went down also. Mm. And uh, Bill didn't do that in so much as he was just prepared for the downfall of society um, and had sort of distanced himself in that way. But these people, they've been living alone for decades at this point. And I, I thought it was interesting for Joel to be so cautious but I, I guess that's just the kind of person he is because uh, these people don't really seem to pose much of a threat, but you can't be too careful when you're not sure who you're going to run across in uh, this time that they find themselves in. Oh, I mean, even in the world before a um, apocalypse, you can legally get shot for being on somebody else's lawn. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, legally, it's it's private property. And so those rules are that times a thousand uh, in the zombie apocalypse. Um, you just can never be too careful when a gun is involved, when you're just trying to pass through and get a little bit of information, such as where are we on the map? Um, you do need to exercise the most caution. I appreciated that Ellie was made to wait all the way upstairs um, just in case something went wrong. I, I think that the level of precaution that that Joel and Ellie are taking is exactly right. And we're being constantly reminded about how dangerous people in this world are. It's true. Um, yeah. And for them to be asking, like, Joel is lost. Joel is lost. They uh, aren't really sure where they are on the map. And so they're asking for that kind of information. And I mean, it would be really easy for the guy to tell them the wrong place. And so I, I appreciate that that version of his caution as well. Uh, Joel, like fact checking the woman by uh, threatening the man, basically. Yeah, um, that is a tactic. I'm going to aside here. That's a tactic straight from The Last of Us Part Two. I'm just remembering. Uh, I, th I think I remember the moment you're talking about. I don't remember which characters it would be, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But just like um, it better match what the other person said. It better match what the other person told me. Yeah, that. Yeah. Oh, you know what? No, no, no. That's straight out of next week's uh, out of the winter scene. Um, Ellie repeats it because she El this is all getting cut out. Ellie yeah. repeats it in part two uh, with when they're trying to find whatever it is in the, in the city again. But Joel next week when he's trying to find Ellie. Uh, he wakes up from the coma and he uh -huh. needs to find Ellie and these two guys come and he uh, you know s strings up both of them and says you got to point to it and it better be the, you know the first one right. to tell the truth lives yeah 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 okay okay yeah that's cool as fuck I didn't even realize that <laughs> um, blah, 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 blah. okay <sighs> yeah and I mean Joel is doing it exactly the way you have to again traipsing through the world um you can't trust people, but they, they seem like nice people. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and they, and they I, all settle into a good enough rapport once the guns are put down yeah. and it's like, OK, well, tell me what you know about this place. Tell me what you know about traveling in this part of the world. And the guy gives a pretty clear warning about how you should not be heading west because there is a river of death and everything around there and past it dies. They've seen bodies of infected, but also not infected left around. And so the best thing to do, if you want to head west, don't do that. Head east instead. It's 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 more than just a bad omen. It's more than just an ill omen. The fact that they call this like the river of death, 
um, Ellie and Joel are are then making fun of this over the next. Well, Ellie is, um, ooh, the river of death, ooh, the river of the dead, ooh. <laughs> but there's a very real um, connection to mythology, Greek mythology in particular, the river Styx, the river mm-hmm. of death. You have to be ferried across it uh, as you go into the underworld. What an amazing connection to be drawing on an episode where uh life and death are seen up close um you know for our main main heroes so it's very just apt I, it's just brilliant it pulls things in that you just like wouldn't expect um but speaking of again the advice that they get to go the other way and the husband and wife team he quickly identifies uh ellie as a psycho <laughs> who's this little psycho um you know she's pointing a gun and like i love whenever a character can get a jab out at like one of our heroes um and we just see how they're viewed from the outside it's a rare and precious gift to get that kind of a that kind of a thing um but what you said specifically about this husband and wife couple being a mirror image to bill uh is brilliant and if you really think about the events of Kansas City as being the midway point, um, which it literally is in the season, then you could actually probably make a good case for a mirroring of events um, going into. Yeah, very nearly. Yeah. I mean, so if these people uh, echo Bill and Frank being outsiders, being outside of normal, like the nearest civilization, then you just keep going in both directions and that is a very exciting kind of thing that I'll be thinking about all week. So thanks for that. (laughs) Um, But, uh, but yeah, so again, they're, they're growing closer and I was really interested in knowing how this was going to pan out. Um, Just this connection with, we know that Joel is genuinely worried for Tommy. So the idea that they must, it still took them three months to get from either Kansas or Missouri um to wyoming they probably didn't risk getting a car again they probably just walked it so at this point if tommy was in trouble he's gone um there's and and yet joel did the right thing to make sure that ellie and he both made it here period right and i mean speaking of his his worry and his fear of losing ellie but also the fear that he's experiencing toward his brother we see something that recurs a couple times in this episode in that scene as they're leaving the cabin leaving this couple behind joel has what appears to be some sort of anxiety or panic attack he he can't breathe he like is is like frozen he he doesn't know what to do ellie's like are you dying i don't know what's going on Holy shit, and, are you dying right <laughs> you have to tell me if you are <laughs> right and so like i said that that comes a couple one or two more times in the episode and i mean we are seeing the cracks in joel more than ever at this point it's so good it's absolutely so good and and he as we continue to talk about joel slowly losing his grip um it's going to be a, a really good conversation about it. Um, but we do get to um, the scene where they talk about their future. And Ellie says she wants to go to space. I just love the idea. It's not not just because it's downtime and exposition, but getting into the characters' heads. Ellie's question stuns Joel because he never thought about it in 20 years. He never thought about what happens after if i am really the cure where do you go from there he just never thought about it and it's like tommy says uh to joel your life stopped at that time when sarah died yeah well joel never had a reason to think about the future at least not not post sarah's death it was living day by day doing what you had to survive there that that's what was what didn't have to think 20 years in the future because honestly he could die tomorrow from an infected or from a raider or from fedra or whatever uh it was just like next day survive next day survive next day survive do what you have to do in between to get to there, that point now with ellie potentially being able to provide a vaccine for for the fireflies and for the the world he can consider a future where he doesn't have to fight 
people and or infected every single day. And so this is the first opportunity he has to think about what kind of life he could have on the other side of this thing, because it's the first thing, first time he really considers that there could be another side of this thing. And I mean, we're confronted with that. Little does he know that he's about to see a huge indicator of what life could be like there right. because as they discover sort of where Tommy is located, it ends up being this highly populated for a post-apocalypse, for a non-QZ zone, safe area where there are children playing, presumably going to school, and there aren't any infected in this whole town of Jackson, Wyoming, that where where Tommy and his wife Maria are, where these, these uh, settlers are, they have a big wall, that helps, but the level of domesticity that they they and and also the uh, competence they have hot water they have electricity they have plumbing they they did all this to build this civilization where they are right now um god i bet they think about their future all the time because they have one right they're living normal lives they they don't have to worry about the same things that the Boston QZ has to worry about or the Kansas City QZ that oh, maybe doesn't goodness. even exist anymore at this point. I bet it does. Uh, has to worry about. So like they they are living as close to our normal here in 2023, our 2023 as possible at at their point in time in their world. Yeah. It's just so stunning actually when 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 we um inevitably do a rewatch uh not a rewatch podcast but when we watch that again <laughs> uh i think no once was enough i said everything i want to say um but uh once we are rewatching in in sort of a, a faster fashion like through binging i think it's going to be more jarring too how um dire everything was the empty gas stations uh and and then you come to jackson and it's just <laughs> everything Movies, you know, cinema, new, new boots, new jackets, a bar, you could, a bar, everything you could ever want and family. So mm -hmm. it's just really I'm really impressed. There's going to be a lot, I think, that we have to say that might fall more under the spoiler section. Um, but this episode, which largely took takes place in this area of Jackson, um, where Tommy and Joel are, and they're, they're just able to have the characterization. They're able to really dig in to who these characters and who these people are. And I got to hand it to them again for taking the time to set most of the episode here um, before moving on, because they do have still a journey ahead of them. So, uh, yeah, we're, we've got Tommy back. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good to see him. Yeah, it is. Um, we hadn't obviously seen him since episode one, and uh, it was a great reunion. Uh, Ellie and Joel are first stopped by uh, people masked on horseback, uh, wondering why they're here, what brings them to their space. Um, and there's the dog sniff test that they don't that they they worry about passing especially ellie because she does have her uh condition <laughs> but they they get past it it's yeah. okay um and so they get into jackson and it's not long before joel sees tommy from across the way and calls out his name and they have a great reunion a big hug and it's everything that you could have wanted from this moment where you get to see Joel has family again. And like what shocked me and I, I thought it to myself at the time is um, Ellie may have grown on Joel and Joel may be uh, able to first show the first signs of appreciation for Ellie now three months plus some um, into their relationship. But his love for Tommy never went away and never had to grow from small moments. And so when he hugs him, hello, and these two brothers embrace and are so glad to see hell just that each other are alive um mm -hmm. still is such a, a powerful moment that like unlocks joel's like here's it's not that he's all of a sudden loving again it's that this is the side of him that has been hidden because we haven't been able to see it because tommy hasn't been in the picture 
And I had speculated in our last episode that maybe there was some sort of ill will from Tommy towards Joel, which is why he hadn't responded over the radio mm. in so long. But uh, we get the answer to that. It was not any ill will, but it was uh, Tommy's wife, Maria, who was kind of just like keeping it in check. We don't want to invite a certain kind of person to Jackson and your brother might be one of those certain kinds of people. So cut off the contact basically is what happened. Maria even later has a com uh, a conversation with Ellie that I'm sure we'll talk about uh, warning Ellie against people like Joel and how the only people who can betray you are the people that you are close to. There are so many good, good moments. And yeah, I mean, I think at this point, it's safe to say that when we do see Tommy and Joel reunite, in Wyoming in The Last of Us first one um, they're still at the settlement is still at the converting the dam to supply power stage of the entire project it's mentioned when Maria is talking about having hot water and plumbing and everything she says they did it a couple of years ago that that was when they fixed the dam you're at the dam in the game so it's actually a huge uh, departure to have the settlement be more developed um, than it is in uh, the game. But uh, the exciting part about that is, again, it allows the characters to do more. So in the game, the relationship between Ellie and Maria, and there is a moment where Joel and Tommy have to talk. Uh, Joel is going to ask Tommy to take Ellie the rest of the way. And Ellie and Maria go off. Well, in the game... They bond over food, just having <laughs> having food in the kitchen. That's literally it. Like, it's just food. And Maria's still nice. She's very friendly. But it's not the level of connection. And you certainly don't get all of this stuff with Maria's character, Maria and Tommy's relationship, feeling very lived in, feeling very they, they've all suffered loss, feeling all of how Tommy's brother issues with Joel get into the way of his marriage uh, multiple times throughout this episode. All of these little things that make these people full humans um, is very, 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 very good. Yeah. And we get the first level of conflict from Tommy and Joel as Joel is kind of giving some of the information, but not all of the information, asking for the Firefly hideout, uh, which we learn is in at the University of Eastern Colorado. It's uh, uh, about a week's ride south from where they are. And Joel first asks Tommy to go with him, right? He says, mm -hmm. hey, you know this area, come with me, uh, help us get there. And... Tommy is hesitant because we, we don't learn this at first, but it doesn't take us long to to find out that Tommy is married to Maria and she is expecting he's going to be a father. And that means that Tommy is finding and building family where Joel has only lost his. And he's kind of starting a new one with Ellie that he hasn't admitted to yet, but he is scared of losing it nonetheless. How many different, like, parent-child relationships can this show just throw at us, like, episode <laughs> by episode? Because although Henry and Sam were brothers, they were very much more of, like, a, a you know, adult-child uh, kind of, you know, dynamic. And with the letter from Bill um, in episode three indicating that he and Joel are alike, that they are protectors of those who may need to be protected. Um, going all the way back to the first episode, really, all of these would-be stand-ins. Oh, Kathleen, too, uh, and her brother. Mm -hmm. And all of these relationships where <laughs> the role of Joel is played by Joel Miller. Um, and the... Like, Tommy having this future that Joel is either not willing to admit to or, or does it's just another indicator of <sighs> Tommy is going to have a relationship that he cares about um, too. And so when he tells Joel, he can't go with him, it's because now he's somebody's parent that, so it's an interesting inversion because Joel doesn't care whether he lives or dies um, because he's lost his child already. It's not like that child will then be parentless. Although that is almost what's, also at play in this episode it's so brilliant 
but Joel is also excited and happy to see his brother again and to be with his family. And Tommy is the only family that Joel does have at this point. And so for Tommy to have married and to now be expecting a child, he's building a family outside of Joel and is no longer going to be dependent on him like he was back in the day. I mean, episode one, he gets arrested and asks for Joel to bail him out. Yeah. And that doesn't appear to be a concern anymore. Uh, I think it was Craig Mazin in the behind the episode at the very end uh, who was talking about how Joel arrives to Jackson and finds that not only does his brother not need saving, but he's thriving. He's he's living a great life in this this commune. And that brings up the the funny quote where uh, <laughs> Joel calls what they got going on, where everybody's sharing ownership of everything and sharing responsibility. He calls it communism. And Tommy says, no, that's not what this is. And Maria says, it's a commune. It's communism. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Tommy's left pondering that. But that that my point is that Joel is not losing his brother but he sort of sees it as that because no longer is joel tommy's only family left yeah yeah that's that's really good the dependence on joel led to uh all of these brother issues which this show takes time to actually go through and i and i and i just love it but let's be real the reason that uh, Tommy is not going to need Joel anymore to bail him out of jail is because he's married to a former district attorney. <laughs> right. <laughs> so she can rig the courts uh, to not have uh, any consequences for, for Tommy in the future. But um, but yeah, I mean, just getting Maria's whole backstory. And, and, and so let's let's talk uh, specifics here. Um, Maria does a really wonderful thing for Ellie, um, including including putting all of her former clothing on a rag pile, uh, and <laughs> completely outfitting her um, in new clothes that are going to withstand the upcoming winter. Um, she also gives her a reusable hygiene product, um, which is amazing for the post-apocalypse. That way, Ellie will no longer need to scour pharmacy shelves. Just that connection and what Maria feels for Ellie, even going so far as to warn her about the type of person that she thinks Joel is. Um, although it kind of falls on like, you know, cold uh, ears here. Um, Maria's connection to Ellie is really, really admirable and shows, and that's more than just, I had a kid once I'm going to parent you is like, Maria is clearly of a strong mindset about what role a kid like what what a kid shouldn't shouldn't have to do and her like advice that she gives ellie and all the help she provides ellie is really welcome as like maybe like a would-be mentor just somebody that's helping ellie on her way not like separate from joel entirely and we get another pretty big moment between the two of them aside from maria warning ellie about joel uh ellie walks into her house and Maria is not there at first. And she sees over the the fireplace on the mantle that there is some sort of memorial there. And on a chalkboard are two names and death or birth and death dates. And one of the names is Sarah. And I mean, Ellie hasn't heard that name before. It doesn't have any context for it. She sees two names on the board of people who died young and assumes that they were both Maria's children. Maria later, as she's giving Ellie a haircut, mentions that, yeah, I was a mother or am a mother. I guess you don't stop being a mother just because your kid passes away, unfortunately. But um, Ellie says, I'm sorry about your kids. And Maria says, well, this kid was mine, but the other kid, that was Joel's daughter. And uh oh, she said something she probably shouldn't have. Ellie now knows something about Joel that Joel probably didn't want her to know. But Ellie's only response isn't to to freak out. It's to say, you know, that explains some of him. It, this yeah. gives me a little bit of psychology behind why Joel is the way he is. I just love how at first she's stunned. There's no word. There's no sound that emanates. She just like is like pause, like taking in that info. Yeah. Um, and then she says, that makes sense. It's like, yes. And and the idea that um, Joel has this info about him get out. Um without his consent but it is also shared family history maria in this episode is family uh and can share 
that kind of a thing because i mean joel's her brother-in-law after all to add sarah would have been her niece right um so it's such an interesting um path that that information takes and it immediately gets to be thrown back in joel's face because of his decision um in this episode so it's it's just a great moment um all in but it makes me think too that the reason maria uh wants to warn ellie um is almost like a motherly um kind of a thing because she wants to protect this person she wants to make sure whatever she's heard about joel and let's pick that apart here because they talk tommy and joel talk about murdering people and tommy says it it wasn't the only way it was the only way we knew um but it wasn't the only path that we mm-hmm. had so how different do we think joel and tommy really were from that guy in kansas city um last week or the week before well joel has made it clear and maria obviously believes this as well that tommy was a follower uh we we learned a little bit of his backstory in previous episodes and so the implication that maria is making is that tommy was only killing people because joel did it first and was doing it uh and tommy was imitating it was what an interesting accusation because i don't know that 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 doesn't empower tommy that's not a glowing you know recommendation of tommy too that he like can't think for himself almost in a way yeah yeah that's true yeah but it um i mean i'm not offended by it i'm just saying it's like such an interesting take where it's like she is willing as a former da uh to completely absolve tommy of his agency here of being an accomplice to this because his older brother was leading the way when in fact what's more likely to explain it is the we did what we had to do to survive mindset of there was actually the end of the world um, right so it's just so interesting because she really does seem to believe it seems like she believes based on that line and how she delivers it that she really doesn't think anything bad of Tommy. Like he did the same things that Joel did, but she's willing to have Joel as this awful, horrible person that she needs to warn Ellie against, but doesn't say the same about Tommy. And and the interplay where uh, Ellie tries to throw that back at her like that is also very interesting because it falls flat it doesn't mean she's a hypocrite it just means she's like a fully fleshed out person who can carry a grudge against somebody that she doesn't know at all because it's easier than holding a grudge against somebody that she somehow fell in love with right and you know speaking of sarah again uh there was that earlier conversation between tommy and joel where joel doesn't give away all of the information about ellie but uh he's he's asking for help going down to the university of eastern colorado and tommy says no because uh guess what my wife's pregnant and joel just like he doesn't freak out but he's not a fan and he gives him the cold shoulder all of a sudden and is pretty grumpy with his brother and says you know what okay fine um I don't remember all of the specific dialogue if you have any that you want to mention in a second, but uh, Joel leaves angry and isn't in a very good mood with his brother. And then as he walks out, he has another one of those anxiety panic attacks uh, come on and he looks across where the villagers are celebrating Christmas around the town Christmas tree and he sees someone who could be in another lifetime, Sarah, as an adult. And she leans over and she has a kid and he's like, oh, wow, look at this life that I could have or could have had had my daughter not been taken away from me. Um, And he's starting to draw the connections that he really is starting to feel this way about Ellie. I just love this technique in cinema. Every time it happens where a character sees something that isn't really there, but it's real to them. And I Mm -hmm. love it. Because in order for that to happen, they had to film it, which means it was real, which means it was there, you know, like, yeah, Voldemort in a suit was really on that train platform. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> it's very much that brilliance. So, you know, and 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 um, Nico Parker is is credited in the episode. And and even though um, I think the footage of of her facing forward is reused from previous episode, but um, it's just a really god so striking moment um that really sells everything joel is 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 afraid of in advance of him just actually coming out and talking about his fears in his second conversation with tommy 
Right. And speaking of that second conversation, this is when Joel really sort of lays bare his whole situation. And Tommy comes in and apologizes, saying, you know, I'm, I'm sorry for the things I said. I, I realize that your situation is different because you did lose your daughter and I can't be angry or hold that against you. And I, I get that you're going through some stuff. And Joel confesses that man, I, I just get so scared. I, I, I'm terrified of losing this. And so I really like how that is a difference from the game in that Joel's not trying to get rid of Ellie because she's cargo. Joel is trying to get rid of Ellie because he's terrified of losing her and being the reason that he loses her because he's getting older, because he's lost some of his hearing. Um, he's just so scared. He talks about how... Uh, Ellie had to save him in Kansas City by shooting a person that she shouldn't have had to shoot because he couldn't hear him. And then he talks about how he watched uh, a brother kill his own brother because Joel just stood there frozen. Uh, that's not that's a simplification, obviously, yeah, yeah, because yeah. we were there for that moment. But that's Joel's interpretation. He couldn't protect Ellie from this infected child. And then he talks about how earlier that day when they were surrounded by the people on horseback who were confronting them and they had that dog that was going to sniff out the infection and he knew that it was a really very real possibility that this dog was going to smell infection on Ellie because of her condition and that wasn't going to be good for her <laughs> in so many words and he didn't do anything in that moment and so Joel is just terrified that he is incapable of being the protector of Ellie that he should be and needs to be in order to complete this mission that he had set out on that was started by first Marlene and then uh, committed him to by Tess. This is the um, part where I got to ask, do we think Joel is stretching things a little bit in order to manipulate Tommy? Um, it's the reason is, it's such an interesting tactic for him to come out with this list of his failures, right? And these are things that he has said to Ellie, I regret that you had to shoot that kid, you know, this, that, the other thing. Like, I get it. But the way in which he connects the whole story, he talks about Marlene, who Tommy knows. He talks about Tess, who Tommy met. Um, and is, all these people are dead. And my hearing is failing. I'm old. Even my dreams are haunting me about failure, Tommy. Like, he brings in his dreams for crying out loud. Now you're just, you're thinking of literally every moment where you, you see yourself failing, you are failing. I'm not saying he doesn't really feel these things, but being able to come to Tommy who's younger uh, and more spry, even in spite of Tommy being a soon to be father that Joel knows, Joel still pulls this, still says, I'm like basically like too old and too scared to really get her all the way you need to do this and that to me speaks more to big brother manipulation um he kn i think he knows it's gonna work i think he knows it's gonna work more than it it's not a hail mary here for joel personally i don't think that is the manipulation in this scene like i i think he's just being honest i, I really i really think he's just laying bare I'm what his believe. fears are yeah. the manipulation and i don't even know if that's even the right word for what i'm thinking of is when he's asking tommy how dangerous is this path really how many people have you seen go and come back mm. tommy says all of them mm. really you're capable enough you can do it but by making tommy say that really yes it's scary yes there's some dangers on the way but we've seen worse and we're prepared for this kind of thing then allows him to turn that around and say okay then what are you really scared of i need you to do this for me because i am too scared to do it myself because of this 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 and this so all he's doing is making tommy say really i would probably be safe if i did this trip yeah yeah yeah, yeah. no that's awesome that's that's really clever um and i think the reasons in the game um, you can see that he's starting to panic about how he feels towards Ellie or how he's starting to feel towards Ellie. But the dialogue is limited to, tell me I need this. Um, and that's about it. And so to see Petro Pascal get to talk about all of his failures um, and his worries and his fears and his failing body, his failing old man body, um, 
is amazing. I'm so glad. Like, I don't want to say I was worried. It wasn't a conscious worry, but like when this 14 year old or 19 year old Bella Ramsey is running ar- circles around you acting wise in previous episodes, because she got <laughs> to have the scene with Sam uh, at the very last episode. And like Joel is still kind of closed up and not really there. Like, man, when your co-star is running circles around you, like Pedro had to step up. And this episode, he finally really got to just like bear his soul in such a satisfying way and how he regards his brother and how he regards his brother's wife and getting angry, not saying congratulations, even Ellie going, Joel, Joel, say congratulate. You know, all of that was just tremendous chef's kiss from Pedro. Yeah, we even get tears. And uh, there was uh, a clip that I saw was an interview with Pedro and Bella, and they were talking about the methods that they use to cry on command oh. in TV shows. And there's like a menthol kind of thing that they can put under their eyes. And I think it was Bella saying that, you know, at one point I worried that it was kind of cheating, but really you shouldn't have to traumatize yourself every time you try and cry it in this job and really it allows you to to focus on all the other things aside from the crying but uh that that was just a fun clip uh that i saw on twitter i think yeah they've been really great i have to say like for if if you're if you go looking for it you can really find so much content with not just Uh bella or pedro separately but also them together they've done so many interview rounds they've done so many little clips and special like one-off things for vanity fair for entertainment weekly that and are continuing to be available for those kinds of things so i'm just like good morning america is doing like because this is uh, such a hit show um now and i'm so thrilled that it is be as successful as i would like it to be as a fan uh of the series in general um it's so great because the internet i mean you can spend a lot of time just watching clips of these two who who seem to get along great in real life as well right um as well. ellie as you would expect in a drama over here is part of this conversation and How sneaky is... of her She's, she must have <laughs> snuck out she saw tommy yeah. kind of leaving and she uh ducked out yeah. of the movie theater yeah so she she overhears some of this conversation namely the part that joel wouldn't want her to hear which is hey i'm handing you off to my brother and uh he he goes to their house that they've been gifted for the night and finds her reading a diary and she's like are these really the only problems that people used to worry about matching skirts and boyfriends and all that kind of stuff um and she's clearly in a kind of mood because she overheard this conversation and they give us one of the best adaptations of a scene from the game almost word for word that we've seen so far yep yep the uh the only line i think is not in there is uh he says you're you're treading on Ellie, you're treading on mighty thin ice right now. It's mm-hmm. mighty thin ice. But he says that with his eyes. You don't need that yeah. line. Um, right. It's so, so, so good that she confronts him. And you know what? Like, again, damn it, she hits him. And it's just yeah. like, I would only be more scared. There it is. There you go. Like, don't tell me I'd be safer. I would only be more scared. He does care about her, and he has to admit it. And I really appreciate, actually, that... She stayed within the confines of the um, settlement in the game. It's this great opportunity for you to see some of Wyoming because she steals a horse and runs off. And she ends up in a country house, which there's some raiders, et cetera, et cetera. But it's that same scene. She picks up a diary. Did people really live like this? That seems dumb. Like just that surrenderment of uh, the innocence of the time before being catapulted right next to this dangerous journey they have to undertake to get her the rest of the way. And they have to do it together. It's just beautiful from, from the outset, beautiful originally and even better in the adaptation. Right. And of course, in this conversation, she mentioned Sarah. So there's, there's the ball drop. She, she let loose that she knows something that Joel didn't want her to know. And uh, that, that shuts him down pretty quickly. So they say some words back and forth. Um, And I like that. It was pointed out in the behind the episode at the end that Ellie says uh, being with Joel makes her less scared, but Joel can't tell her that being with her makes him more scared. I love and that yeah, it, it's a, it's a really touching argument because we know where these characters are and where they want to be and where they don't want to be, and it it ends pretty coldly, and Joel leaves and 
that's that you're going with Tommy in the morning. Uh, but the next morning, as uh, Tommy gathers Ellie, who's already sitting there waiting for her things, and there's sort of this this sense of expectation that maybe Joel has changed his mind and is going to be the one opening the door, but there's Tommy instead. Uh, so they they go to the stable, and there's no banter, there's no conversation. It's pretty cold. He just says stables. I love. And I love that just, you picked up yeah. on that. I'm gonna yeah, yeah. I'm gonna it's because they don't have a rapport. It's so brilliant that there's no like next to no words passing between them stables this because now that we're so accustomed to joel and ellie Mm -hmm. uh and and tommy's his brother tommy we know is a nice guy who's capable of conversation but Mm -hmm. that stranger factor where they genuinely just don't know each other um you're like how is this gonna work on the road like ellie's gonna pull out the pun but no not she won't even bother (laughs) pulling out the pun book for tommy like it's not that he wouldn't like it it's just the cold this is distant this not it's not gelling at all right um which is no fault of anybody's it's just that this is not the right fit so when joel is at the stables and decides he's gonna i I just love that they showed joel agonizing the night before over Mm -hmm. His choice and over his decision. This is something you'd never be able to get in the game, um, unless it were like a decision moment. Press X to, uh, <laughs> you know, take her on, or circle to not, and your your consequence plays out at the end. Um, you would never get this kind of moment where Joel is maybe experiencing regret, um, trying to decide how he feels. If it's true what Craig Mason said that Joel can't tell Ellie, but being around her makes him more fearful then his decision is to be more fearful. His decision in deciding to be the one to take her is to face his fear and his ever sense, ever growing sense of doom. And that more than anything up to this point, that makes him a hero Mm -hmm. uh, for us is he's deciding to face his fear, um, which we now know is so present uh, we now heard it from him and we see him agonizing over it. So I just love that in this moment, Joel is the hero for, right. for doing this, for doing the right thing, sparing his brother of a potential nasty end, sparing his brother's wife uh, from being a widow um, in doing this. We can only assume that that was the stakes. Um, so the only other thing I'll say uh, regarding, you know, Ellie and Joel being back together again before they move on to their next station is that Joel would have had a very nice speech. (laughs) And (laughs) I love that it doesn't get to be said because you still believe, I believe that it would have been beautiful. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) How was, she just hits him with the bag and is like, great, let's go. Like, you know, it's so Ellie. It's so anti-climate. It's like, whatever, I'm still mad at you. Like this, this makes it better, but fine. We're not going to talk about it. Like, he, what would he have said? He would have said something very important, but all he got out was, it's important that you have a choice. And that alone actually speaks volumes about where Joel's thoughts are here. Well, I also don't think that Ellie is still angry with him as soon as he's like, you have a choice. I think she's like, okay, we're, we're just picking up where we left off. Yeah, I like, think it, it's mm-hmm. it's a pretty quick switch. There's no mention of the argument the night before. Right. It's like, okay, well, good. We're just going to continue on then. And it's they, they're back to where they were. But even beyond where they were, as they, they leave and they've left Jackson behind, and we see some of their travel as they get close to the university, Joel, I think, is immediately even more different than he was before Jackson. He's more conversational here. He's more jokey. He tries teaching her how to shoot the rifle and also proves how deadly with it he still is. He yeah. he he shows that he does still have some skill, obviously. But he just seems so much more relaxed in, to a certain extent to me. Um as they're making this extra journey it's like they have both chosen each other at this point because this before Jackson they did not choose each other. That's right. It's like renewing their vows. It's like this is where they've <laughs> this is where they've both committed to be on this journey to each other and that's not nothing that's amazing. And just his line about I thought you deserve a choice shows that he is actually is not treating her like a child anymore. Mm-hmm. Um he has decided that she has the right to choose, that she has the right of agency. And uh yeah, that's huge because it shows exactly where she is in his mind. He's elevated her to personhood. Um, right. 
in giving her the choice. And and you know what? Tommy gets it. <laughs> Their goodbye is good. And and Tommy saying there will always be a place for you uh, here after when you get back uh, gives us hope that it's all going to turn out OK. Yeah, it does. Uh, Joel says, you know, we'll take you up on that. So and yet or and still they also managed to fit in the pretty much the whole University of Eastern Colorado uh sequence into 10 or 15 minutes of the tv show which is amazing it's safe to say i think in the game there's some infected you go into the building da, 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 da. but but the medical equipment them finding where they really need to go that it was recently abandoned all of this is it's like despite how streamlined it is it feels natural it worked mm-hmm. yeah they see the monkeys from the game. That was a nice touch. The monkeys, yeah. The, I think Reese's <laughs> monkeys. Uh, yeah, they're they're great. Ellie's line about uh, researching so hard that the researchers themselves turned into monkeys. Right. <laughs> it's just like the crazy, oh, her learning to whistle was in this uh, episode too. Like there's so many moments of Ellie, not just from the game, but the way that Bella... The, when they come when they when they come through Bella, they're hers, you know, and it and it's really it's really great to see that in action uh, throughout the whole thing. Yeah. Um, and they do find like you mentioned, they find their next destination and it appears to be Salt Lake City. So they they know where they're headed next. If if the fireflies are to be found, that's where they're going to be found. Uh, but then raiders show up. They hear they hear some people show up and so they try to escape but uh one catches up to them as they reach the horse and joel is able to kill him uh choking him snapping his neck just like um, in the game yeah but but the man swung a bat and missed and it splintered and then he stabbed joel in the gut with it and it is a pretty heavy puncture wound uh joel pulls it out and is bleeding pretty heavily um and they escape on horseback and the raiders stop following them but the episode ends with joel sort of succumbing to his wound and falling off the horse bleeding pretty heavily and ellie's crying over him and says you know i can't do this without you and cut end episode scene yikes so many feelings <laughs> first of which that song Let's talk yeah. about it. The episode ends with a beautiful cover version. Craig Mazin told us this would be back. He right. said, Depeche Mode's Never Let Me Down Again would come back once more this season. He would not say when. Guess what? It's now. And it's a beautiful cover from none other than Craig Mazin's own daughter, Jessica Mazin. How amazing is this? That's pretty great. I, I just had the thought. I want to compare if they use the same section of the song in both of its appearances. Ooh. Like, is it a different verse or a different chorus or whatever this time around than they used at the end of the first episode? Uh, I'll have to go back and compare that and see like if they're trying to hint at any sort of specific thing between those two usages of the song it's a slowed down version it's much more haunting um partly because it's also coming from a woman's voice uh and is an acoustic version not like the 80s pumped up drum beat synth wave kind of thing um but it perfectly reflects now possibly a, a passing of the torch to uh, the idea that at the end of the first episode, it's very much a man's world. You got Bill sending the signal. You got Joel getting the signal. You got um, there's trouble, but like these men are going to deal with it. Coupled with the next time you hear that song and it's Ellie, presumably alone, lost, confused, doesn't know how she's going to survive. And it's I'm going, I'm taking a ride with my best friend. <laughs> Never going to let me down again. It's like shit. The, he let he let her down. All of Joel's fears that he says in this episode that he has of failing her. He's a, I mean, he just saved her life, but he's dying. He's bleeding out and he's failed her in this moment. There's just her. Yeah, that's brilliant story set up and payoff in a certain way, um, because this whole episode was about Joel showing that he's scared and sort of 
selfishly, unselfishly trying to give Ellie to his brother for the remainder of the journey because yes, he's trying to make sure Ellie gets there safely, but he's also trying to protect himself from hurt. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that's a different motivation from the game, Joel, where Joel is just more or less trying to say, like, she's cargo and I'm done with my part of the mission. Yeah, I think um, it, it doesn't evolve yet to the point where he's uh, knowably offloading her onto Tommy because of his emotions, like to save his emotions. Although uh, in the game, Tommy does produce a picture of Sarah and gives it right. to Joel and Joel says, no, I'm good. So he's he's actively pushing away the kinds of thoughts that would lead to the conversation they actually have in the show. The show actually goes there, which is great. Right. Yeah. So they they've been setting up this whole episode joel's fear of failing again because that's what he's been doing in his eyes all this time he failed sarah at the outbreak of the pandemic he failed tess when she died um and now he's worried about failing ellie and you get them setting off on their adventure again they've chosen each other at this point they make it down to the university of eastern colorado seemingly without incident and what awaits them there bandits and uh uh-oh joel actually did fail he he his his fears came true it seems and that's where we end what happens next we don't know we don't know well (laughs) spoilers coming up but um before we go there i would say that This is a tremendously impactful emotional moment for Ellie here uh, that was captured on screen that the episode was bold to go out on. And if should it be the last time that Joel and Ellie look into each other's eyes, um, the presence of the song that closes the credits is a mirror reflection of the first time we heard it when they had just left the apartment and set off on their journey together. And this could be where their journey has ended. Um, So I just get chills thinking about the song's presence at the beginning of Joel and Ellie's journey and the potential end of Joel and Ellie's journey. There's a comparison that I just thought of that takes place within this own episode because there's a scene or a moment that we didn't mention, which is when they were camping uh, and it's time to go to bed, Ellie says, do you want first watch or second? Mm. And Joel says, I'll take both. You get some sleep. And we wake up in the morning, or at least uh, what we do, Joel's asleep. Uh, He fell asleep during his watch and he panics for a second. Uh Oh, where's Ellie? Uh Oh, where's my gun? And he realizes, okay, Ellie woke up and took his gun and took over the watch because Joel fell asleep. Again, another example of him failing her, quote unquote, in his eyes. Um, And here, in that moment, Ellie's like, well, I did exactly what you told me to. I checked my six. I found high ground. I, I, I kept watch. I did what you're supposed to do. I am capable of doing this. I am independent to a certain extent because you have taught me how to do it. And now, here at the ending of this episode, Joel is not only asleep. He did not fall asleep on his watch. He is out for the count. We don't know what Joel's future is at this point in the show. And Ellie does not feel so confident right now (laughs) as she did earlier. (laughs) That's a, I think that's pretty great. That's awesome. That's, she's just going to have to prove it. Yeah. She's going to have to. How independent are you, Ellie? How much did you learn? Let's find out. So. I think that'll do it for the non-spoiler section and uh, not too much to go on, but it is it is very much um, very, very, very spoiler heavy for the future um, because of the big moments of this episode. So uh, we will um, say goodbye to our people who just want to enjoy uh, the show as it is. Peace (laughs) and insert spoiler warning now. Spoiler time! This is a section of the show placed behind a spoiler warning. Because, as Pedro Pascal says... Some things must stay sacred. (laughs) If you don't want to be spoiled, keep the rest of the episode sacred, and we'll see you next week. And... we're back. We're here. Um, to the spoiler section. (laughs) 
Well, so starting off with a sort of smaller spoiler, because I saw in your notes that you had mentioned this as well. Uh, Dina, question mark? Question mark? <laughs> There's, what do you think? Did, did, was that your thought when you saw it? Yes, first? automatically, I thought Dina. That... I mean, to be honest, it took me a long time to remember her name. <laughs> oh, yeah. But I immediately was like, was that her? It and... would be uh... crazy. And and yet, altogether not unlike uh, Druckmann and Mason to have peppered in um, this huge hint at a future love interest of Ellie um, in this episode. Not only that, but cast her. Like, yeah. go on and well, actually you know... cast somebody. I would not be at all surprised if that was Dina. I mean, I also wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't, but I, I like to cling to the idea that, yes, that was Dina, and they're really thinking that far ahead. In the same way that I think uh, another character, major character for part two, is probably going to be introduced when we get to the ending of this season. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't think that... it. Well, in the video games, it sort of makes sense that we would learn about other characters in the future, but because we have both games existing already it makes sense to set those characters up now and so i fully expect by the time we get to the ending of season one end of episode nine there's a character that we're going to meet and uh not a huge spoiler to just say her name abby Mm -hmm. i think we're going to meet abby in this season at least in a very limited capacity um And so for us to have that glimpse of the character who will be Dina in season two, I think that's perfect. I love it. I love the plausible deniability. I'm sure it'll probably come up on the official podcast, which I'm looking forward to. Uh, But I I didn't even think about them talking about it. Oh, God, I hope they do. Um, But suffice to say that in the episode, it's perfectly explainable as Mm -hmm. the children in uh, Wyoming here in Jackson Uh, are just curious because Ellie's like nothing they've ever seen. And that's fair. That Mm -hmm. totally works. Who's this little psycho? They're all thinking that too. (laughs) Um, (laughs) She stands out, not just because she's wearing rags, uh, but she she cusses. She's got attitude. She's got a real authority problem here. She had a gun. She had a gun. They don't shoot here. The kids probably can't. We do get more information from part two of the game of what the process is on keeping watch. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the, you know, the children do eventually start going on um, shifts and rotations. But right now at this moment, it plays as one of the children, well, let's say one of the teenagers uh, is curious about Ellie. Fine, that's it. That's the explanation. But if it's Dina, then it's (laughs) also that Dina was curious for whatever reason. Maybe it's an instant spark. Maybe it's an instant attraction uh, to the girl that just breezed in the door. Uh, But whatever it might be that caused Dina to leave whatever station she was doing, whatever her role or task is to go look at Ellie and find out more is such a perfect thing because it also looks forward to next week when I believe we will be getting the Ellie and Riley backstory and Mm -hmm. Riley is also a character uh, that sneaks out, does things that uh, she's maybe not supposed to, or nobody's allowing her to do takes the initiative the way that this character, whoever that girl was looking in on Ellie also just took the initiative to go and look at her. So I, if that was Dina and I think it, it now I'm like, oh, God, it had to have been, um, <laughs> well, we both had the thought that says yeah. something. Yeah. I mean, maybe the average person who has played both games didn't have that thought immediately, but I, I don't think it's coincidence that both of us had the thought. And I, I think that's probably intentional. And so I will be curious to see if they mentioned it in the podcast this week, but I mean, they picture the casting call of that. They had to do, yeah. they, they they did the script reading. They did, I mean, you could just read scenes from the game. It's not like they really had to write out a whole thing, but they had to get an actor who had chemistry with Bella Ramsey. And like, mm-hmm. I mean, at this point, it could be everybody has chemistry because she's awesome. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, they did the casting. So we'll just see where that, where that plays out. Um, slightly bigger spoilers just for um, Jackson in general. We do obviously return here uh, Mm -hmm. someday. And I'm so curious how this works from a logistics standpoint, because uh, (laughs) like, was this episode really just a preview of season two? Like, did they 
strike the set, but then just go put it in a neat box somewhere where they can then pull all the pieces back out? Like, what do you think happened here for, like, straight? They knew they were coming back here. So you build these things to last? Well, I think story wise, it makes sense to give them a reason aside from just Tommy being in the area to come back. Like, there is an established community. That is the reason to go back. Mm, um, and so it's a great point. Yeah, I, I I don't know what they're setting up for season two, if it'll be some sort of interstitiary. I don't need, Is that a right word? That seems right. Interstitial. Interstitial. Sure, that works <laughs> between part one video game and part two video game. And maybe we won't get part two until a little bit later if we'll have some sort of like chill episodes where we just hang out in jackson for a little bit god i would love um, that I, I don't know exactly what to expect from season two which we know we are getting if it'll be a straight up adaptation of part two if we'll get some extra stuff i don't know uh but my point is because again we have had part two the game come out since part one the game and we know that Jackson does develop. Why not just develop it now? We don't need the gameplay of Joel fixing the the Generation. water turbine. Yeah. We don't we don't need that. But what they do need is a story reason to come back. And I think it's a more powerful reason to come back if there's already an established and working and thriving community than just because Joel's brother there is there and they they have to work to build this community. That's either so... way, I think it would have worked. But yeah. Yeah. That's such a good point. That's that's clearly why they did this. <laughs> like once, you, once I hear it, I'm like, yep, yep, that's the reason. Um, it's great to have something to look forward to, to come back to, something that, that yeah. home will still be there, that somebody will be there waiting for you um, back. So, uh, 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 it's so good. Um, yeah. Regarding the next group of people that we have encountered... Um, this is the group that in the game turns out to be cannibals. Mm -hmm. Um, and they were keeping watch over the university of Eastern Colorado. Ellie has a lot of work ahead of her interacting directly and interfacing with the leader, uh, of this group of people herself. And I love the idea that the show has set her up to be on her own because, there is some real fire that that those see. I mean, those scenes play so well in the game. They're only going to play better on the show um, mm -hmm. when for all the reasons we've previously stated about the adaptation. So uh, what was interesting in the brief snippet we got of this group now is that they were kind of underpowered. They weren't carrying guns um, or they would have shot at Ellie and Joel as they as they rode away. In fact, Ellie shooting back stops them from pursuing. They can't return the fire. So already, I think just in that little that little thing I noticed of none of them have guns um, speaks to not their capabilities, but their how um, how many supplies they have and and kind of like their status is is a little lower, which directly feeds into um, the other things we'll learn about them, like. They really are scavenging the humans that they come into contact with in almost every way you possibly can. So the fact that those guys weren't armed and they're the leading party, they just have baseball bats. We know baseball bats can be lethal, um, but, you know, it's not AK-47s. It's not uh, we've overthrown our QZ and we have all their weapons now. Yeah. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think that this means we're getting Troy Baker very soon because isn't his character affiliated with this group? Yeah. So if we want to prognosticate here, um, I know they spent two episodes in Kansas city, but I'm thinking because of how much story they have to get through, even though they did a ton of story tonight too, it, again, gameplay wise, it was only 90 minutes. The next segment of the game is an entire season of story i think and it's all to do with well because they're throwing in left behind so mm -hmm. here's the thing so i think that next episode um is going to be ellie episode i would love for it to be um you know she's trying to find antibiotics to save joel's life and she goes to a mall which is, is exactly what happens in left behind she's in a mall in present day during that during the moment when joel is injured and she's in a mall with Riley back in the Boston QZ. And I would love to see it go back and forth. And that'll be the thing. That 
doesn't get her to the cannibals. And so no. then there's still a moment where Joel is still out cold, only beginning to stay, still stay alive, where she then meets the leader while hunting deer. Uh, the leader of the cannibals, they have a standoff. Uh, she abuses who will be the Troy Baker character into going and getting the medicine. Uh, or actually, that's how that happens. Damn. So there's just all these interactions that have yet to take place because they're adapting uh, left behind. I could easily see this now becoming not just one episode where it's just Ellie, but almost two full episodes where it's just Ellie. Yeah. I Well, so I think that episode seven next episode is probably just going to be straight up left behind. And I, I think it'll be going back and forth like you do in that DLC. Uh and I, I mean, I, I think that's all they really have room for uh, based on what we saw in the preview, because the preview they showed us, they don't even see any. They don't even show us any of the in-between stuff. They just show us the flashbacks. We see Riley and Ellie from before the story takes place. That's all we get. Um, but I bet we will get those back and forth. We've got to see some sort of present day Ellie as she's sort of suffering through figuring out what to do with the whole Joel situation. And so what I think that means is that episode eight will then be winter from the game, the original game where we will get a lot of Ellie for sure. But I bet by the end of that episode, we'll have some Joel stuff towards the end as well. So I don't know if that means it'll be a slightly longer episode or they just adapt it really well where it makes sense or like this episode felt really well adapted and we still did a lot of things, but it wasn't was blown away. Long. I was honestly blown away. Yeah. And so I think that episode nine is going to be, they've gotten past this and here we are in Salt Lake City. And yeah. that's just the end. It's going to be a straight up adaptation of the end of the game. So, so now yeah. We, yeah, because this was episode six, now we have, you know, three episodes left to play with. We know, I, I, I think that's a, that, that's a realistic timetable of what, yeah. what's to come. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I conjectured at the end of our last episode in the spoiler section that episode seven would be last of us or the uh, left behind, um, which might've been public knowledge to people who'd looked up the episode titles, mm. but I hadn't. And so I feel, uh, <laughs> feel good about guessing where left behind was going to land in the scheme of things. Congratulations. You get it. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, it was kind of just like logical timeline stuff. No, so no, no, I, no. I can't but be I'm, too proud, but I'm still, I'm glad to see it working that way that yeah. you know, Joel getting injured because they did the Eastern Colorado stuff in the last 10 minutes of this episode, mm -hmm. instead of the first 10 minutes of the next episode, um, that frees us up to do a lot more of that timey wimey nonsense without it being too bogged down. Um, yeah. but speaking of timey wimey nonsense, at some point we are getting Ashley Johnson as Ellie's mother. Yeah. So, uh, as was released in the, maybe I shouldn't say that, um, at some point we are also getting a cameo from Ashley Johnson and mm -hmm. it's been revealed, uh, actually by the creators too, about what role she's playing. But I'll mm -hmm. say that there's, it, it's going to be in a flashback of some sort. And, um, that may be tied in next week. Maybe mm -hmm. we do get a real deep Ellie flashback, um, which would it have consequences explaining maybe even why Ellie is immune that could come during left behind, or it could come, I'd say the final episode, um, because mm -hmm. that, because Marlene would be in the final episode. Mm -hmm. And so it makes sense to see Ellie's mother, like entrust Ellie with Marlene from the get go. Like, so it'd be good to have them all dead. So maybe, maybe the Ashley Johnson cameo will be episode nine. Yeah, I could see it either way. I could see them starting off Left Behind DLC with, uh, or I say DLC, the Left Behind segment with uh, uh, that cameo and then like the story of Ellie growing up in the QZ Fedra school or whatever, because then they'd also be adapting some of American Dreams, which is the comic book uh, that gave some of that backstory and how uh, Ellie actually meets Riley. Um, and... Uh, it should be said, maybe we should point this out. Maybe the only people listening at this point are the ones who have played the games and don't mind the spoilers. But just in case, Troy Baker was the original Joel in the video games and Ashley Johnson was the original Ellie in the video games. So I just wanted to put that out there because we just threw names out there and I don't oh, know how. Yeah. Well, and and uh, Troy Baker, who doesn't say it often enough on the HBO Last of Us podcast, uh, yeah. yes, was Joel in the game. But he's, he's hosting now and um, that's a great fit. 
Uh, yeah. th- like I liked it from day one, but it's also it turn it turns out to be just like a really because they already have like Druckmann and, and Troy already had this great rapport. And then Craig being such a fan of the both of them is able to like it's just it just works. Yeah. So so any final thoughts uh, on this week's episode? I mean, what another amazing, amazing adaptation. It was nice to get a little bit of an emotional reprieve. In this episode, I, I wouldn't say that it was devoid of like those tearjerker moments. Like I definitely did tear up once or twice in this episode, particularly at the happy moment when Joel and Tommy were reunited. Oh. But uh, after Henry having to kill his brother and then committing suicide at the end of the last episode and knowing that next episode is left behind and what we have it set in store for that. Uh, I was glad to have a little bit of a break from just like being completely emotionally devastated this time around. <laughs> yeah, that was nice. <laughs> but, you know, it's up ups and downs this week. Next week, we just who knows what's happening? Who knows? Yeah, what's I think happen. we've got three episodes of really heavy emotional stuff ahead of us. So I mean, we, we had to have at least one. Riley now is going to break my heart for sure. Yeah. Um, but. Yeah, more opportunities for more pun books and uh, photo booths and all that stuff. It's just going to be great uh, seeing the, them dress up a mall for the pandemic. Maybe two malls if we're really lucky um, yeah. is just very exciting. So, uh, well, I can't wait. This time it's only seven days instead of nine <laughs> or ten. <laughs> I feel like I can manage that having gone through the hell that was nine days last week. Yeah, I, that definitely seems a lot more doable. I'm excited. So we will uh, be here for next week uh, for the adventures of uh, Ellie. <laughs> John, yeah, yeah. It's just like <laughs> the adventures of Ellie next week. Maybe we'll wear these shirts, but we'll tape them tape over Joel. <laughs> <laughs> I laugh. Uh, I joke, but um, but yes, Chad. Uh, I will include uh, all the places which you can find us. Um, on social media, uh, in the uh, show notes, uh, Chad is at Chadadada on Twitter, and I am at Spielerman. Any other final thoughts? Nope. It's cool. a good show. Thanks for, <laughs> yeah, this show's actually pretty good, I think. And the thing is, people are noticing, which is yeah. wonderful. <laughs> uh, thank you for sporing, and we'll catch you all next week. Bye. Bye. <laughs>